hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about crystal oscillators and the measurements associated with them by looking at what negative resistance is and how it can be measured. And of course, have a look at what can be done when the measured negative resistance isn't enough. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So let's start things off by looking at what negative resistance represents and why it's so important. So when talking about oscillators, their main purpose is to, well, oscillate. But since the components and environmental parameters will vary, you need to somehow make sure that the oscillator will oscillate in any realistic condition. So some way to assess that you have the necessary conditions required for oscillation to occur and persist is needed. Now, when modeling Pierce crystal oscillators and their oscillation requirements, there are two main approaches. On the one side you have the Barkhausen criterion, and on the other side you have the negative resistance criterion. So one simplified way of representing an oscillator is by using an amplifier and a feedback circuit. So to create a loop with these two components, and the necessary conditions required to get this thing to oscillate are known as the Barkhausen criteria. So you need a gain of at least one over the entire loop, and you need a phase shift, which is an integer multiple of 360 degrees or two pi radians. Now at steady state, when the oscillator is oscillating, the gain will be equal to one, but to get the oscillator into that steady state, you want to have a bit more gain to make it to, well, start up and get into that final state. And the phase shift of the circuit is usually ensured by design. So now if we look at our Pierce crystal oscillator, so the amplifier is, well, the amplifier that's providing the gain. And for the phase shift, 180 degrees are provided by the inverting feature of our amplifier. And the rest of the 180 degrees are coming from our external circuitry. So to verify that our circuit oscillates and it has margin to oscillate, we would need to somehow measure its gain. But this is quite a difficult thing to do, considering how sensitive the crystal oscillator is to external circuitry. So you can't really measure the gain without being too invasive into the circuit. So another way of looking at the crystal oscillator is using the negative resistance model. So in this model, the active part of the circuit, so the amplifier, is represented by a negative resistance, and we also have an oscillator reactance, and the crystal is represented by the motional resistance and the motional reactance. And the criteria needed to get this thing to oscillate is to have the negative resistance's absolute value equal to the motional resistance, and of course we want it to be a bit larger everywhere else so that it can get into that steady state, and the reactances need to be again equal. Now. If we transpose this model onto our crystal oscillator, so our negative resistance and oscillator reactants are represented by the amplifier and the load capacitors and, well, any external capacitors, and the motional part of the circuit is the crystal. Now, the resistance of the crystal, we can figure out, so we can calculate it and measure it, it's not that difficult. And to figure out the maximum negative resistance that the amplifier can provide, we can try to push the loop to the edge, so to see when it stops working. And it stops working when our negative resistance is smaller than our external resistance. So if we add an external resistor in series with our crystal, the total external resistance from the amplifier's point of view will be the sum of this resistor and the crystal's resistance, and we can slowly increase this resistor up until the point the circuit doesn't work. So with the last value of the external resistor that the circuit works with, summed up with the ESR of the quartz crystal, we get our negative resistance. Now for today's experiments, I'm using the same board as I used in previous videos. So it's a basic peak microcontroller based circuit that other than the controller and the oscillator also has a BNC output. So here we can see an output frequency that is the oscillator frequency divided by 16. And on the oscillator side, the oscillator is set into HS mode, and for our first experiments, 
I'm using an 8 MHz quartz with dual 47 picofarad capacitors and a 10 kilo ohm series resistance. So with this setup, I can ensure a 15 ppm frequency accuracy and a good drive level below 100 microwatts. So to perform this measurement, we can add a trimming potentiometer in series with the quartz crystal and starting off from a value of 0 ohms, slowly increase it and verify the circuit that it's still oscillating. So you can verify the oscillation either by using a spectrum analyzer and a near field probe like I showed in this older video or we can measure some sort of output coming from the IC. So right now I wrote a very basic program that is outputting a 500 kilohertz square wave and this is what I'm measuring. So I will be slowly increasing the value of the resistor and then with every increase restarting the circuit to see if it still oscillates. So with this particular IC, it's not really stopping from oscillation, but rather it's oscillating at a completely different frequency. So rather than having a 500 kilohertz square wave, now we're getting a 1.75 kilohertz square wave. So the crystal is no longer working. So I added too much resistance. So I'll need to slowly decrease it and then see exactly when oscillation restarts. So right now we have our 500 kilohertz back. So we'll consider this our highest value with which the circuit still works. So now I can stop the circuit, remove the trim potentiometer and use a no meter to see exactly what resistance I was adding while still keeping the circuit functional. So only 34 ohms. So with this particular crystal, we've added 34 ohms to the already existing ESR of 37 ohms giving us a total negative resistance of 71 ohms. Now, you may have noticed a small problem with this setup. The trim potentiometer is quite a large structure that doesn't just bring resistance, but also stray capacitance and stray inductance. So to maximize precision, you can figure out the approximate added resistance value with the trimming potentiometer, and then proceed to replace it with small fixed value resistors to eliminate the parasitics as much as possible. Now, it's quite a time-consuming process, but it will provide a bit more accuracy if that is really needed. So, we got a negative resistance of 71 ohms. Is that good or bad? Well, a more useful way of expressing this value is in the form of the oscillation margin. How many times is the negative resistance greater than the maximum ESR that the crystal can have? A parameter that is present in the datasheet. So, for our particular crystal, that has a maximum ESR of 40 ohms, this yields a value of 1.77. But what does that mean? I mean, it's above one, so it oscillates, but we could already see that. So how large should this value be? Well, most recommendations you will find is that the value of five or more is enough to ensure safe operation under any condition. Even though some manufacturers will recommend even more, and some might say that even less is enough. But where does this value come from? I mean, why 5 and not some other random value? Well, the oscillation margin doesn't just determine if the oscillator oscillates, but how fast it can start up. So it is recommended that an oscillation margin of at least 2 is needed to start up the oscillator in a timely fashion. And then we need to consider the mathematics behind this parameter. So without going into too many details, the negative resistance is a function of the load capacitors and the shunt capacitance of the crystal and layout. So once a circuit is built, these parameters are virtually constant. So very small variations with time and temperature can occur, but the negative resistance is also dependent on the amplifier's transconductance. And now this parameter is quite sensitive to temperature. Now, to get an idea of just how much the gain of your amplifier can vary, I found this application note from Microchip, so application note 943, in which they analyze how the crystal oscillator can be modeled. And one of the really interesting pieces of information present in this application note is this table in which they give us an example of how the gain can vary over production lot and temperature. So if we start off with a generic average value of one at 25 degrees, based on production lot, this can vary 
up and down by about plus 12 minus 19 percent so at 25 degrees but then if we take into consideration also temperature we can reach an extreme maximum at minus 40 degrees of 60 percent more than our average at 25 and we can get to an extreme minimum of minus 35 percent at 125 degrees and well if we compare the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum well we get an almost one to three ratio now of course these are just example values whatever circuit you're working on will have completely different values than this maybe your temperature range is not minus 40 to 125 it's something smaller so again the variation will not be this extreme but this just goes to show what sort of values you should be expecting so your gain will not vary by a factor of 100 but it can go to double and half of the initial value so if you're looking for the extreme case in which you have the lowest possible gain this will be achieved at the highest ambient temperature and to showcase this i prepared a setup in which i'm measuring the crystal current which is directly linked to the gain and i will try to vary this by applying a bit of temperature so i will be using the hot air gun and i set this to 200 degrees celsius so hopefully it doesn't melt anything so we're starting off with an rms amplitude of about 11.6 11.8 millivolts and if we heat up the ic we can see this value going down so we're already at 10 9.8 and so on so the hotter the ic gets the lower the gain is and therefore the lower the current going through the ic gets so we're going to get the smallest gain at the highest temperature And finally, if I remove the heat, we can see the signal slowly recovering. So now when the IC cools down, we're going to get back our gain. So this is a completely reversible process. Another thing to take into consideration is that the amplifier gain is also supply voltage dependent. Usually, lower supply voltages will mean lower gain. And to show this, I will be measuring the supply voltage using the voltmeter and also measuring the current going through the crystal. So to see how the crystal current varies with the supply voltage. So if we start off at a low 3.3 volts, we have around 5.2, 5.4 millivolts of RMS voltage measured by the current probe. And if we start to increase the supply voltage, we can see that with every step in voltage, we get a step in the measured current. So the higher the supply voltage, the higher the drive current. Now having such a huge voltage variation occurring in real life is not that realistic, but you still can get a plus minus 2% voltage variation. So for example, a 5 volt supply can be anywhere between 5.1 and 4.9. And this will have a direct impact in your amplifier gain and from that in your negative resistance. So your worst case gain will occur at maximum temperature and minimum supply voltage and as a general rule of thumb it was determined that to compensate for all of these variations in gain a room temperature oscillation margin of at least five is a safe choice if your system needs to work in an extended temperature range so minus 40 to 125 degrees celsius now if you need to cover a smaller range like 0 to 60 degrees celsius so commercial temperatures then you can accept less but usually a minimum of two is recommended. So what can you do if you don't have enough gain margin? I mean, if the possibility exists, you could increase the gain of the amplifier by some registry settings, as mentioned in the previous video on drive level measurements. But what else? Well, let's have another look at the parameters impacting this value. So other than the gain of the amplifier, you have all these capacitors. Couldn't something be done about those? Now, to get a better feeling of how these values will impact the negative resistance of your system, I found this really nice article on the Maxim website. So it's about designing crystal oscillators and it covers the basic model and, well, the mathematics behind everything. And we come to these two very nice graphs here. So the first graph illustrates how your negative resistance will vary for a fixed gain 
based on the load capacitance and on the shunt capacitance. So the higher the shunt capacitance is, the lower your maximum achievable negative resistance is, and the load capacitance, well, you have a certain peak at some value, and before and after that, the negative resistance will go lower. Now, ideally, you want to sit on the right side of this graph. So higher load capacitance to give lower negative resistance. So in case you have too much load capacitance and you're getting too little negative resistance, you might want to try to choose a component that requires less load capacitance so you get a higher negative resistance. Now, the other graph we find here is, well, similar to this one, but rather than varying the load capacitance, they vary the gain. So in some cases, more gain can cause less negative resistance. So in this example, again, they're varying the shunt capacitance and more shunt capacitance means less negative resistance. But by varying the gain of the amplifier, the transconductance, again, you have a peak and then afterwards more gain will cause less negative resistance. So the two graphs are interlinked. Basically, when your gain goes too far up, you're moving this peak to the right. So with a fixed load capacitance, you'll be getting lower and lower on the left side of the upper graph. Now, in real life, usually it's not that easy to change the gain of the amplifier. You might have this option if you have some sort of registry settings, but it's not always the case. And if you do have negative resistance problems, one of the easiest things you can do is most often go for a crystal that requires smaller load capacitors. In the end, it's easier to change the crystal and not the amplifier. And to illustrate this, what I have here is the exact same board as we had before, but rather than using a crystal that requires 30 picofarads of load capacitance, which was achieved with dual 47 picofarad capacitors, I swapped it for a different crystal that only requires 20 picofarads of load capacitance that I achieved with dual 33 picofarad capacitors. And if we measure this circuit, so again, I added the trimming potentiometer in series, and we can slowly increase the value until the circuit doesn't work. So right now it's working. Still working. And now it doesn't work. So let's just go back to the last value that did work. Okay, so this is the last value that works. And now we can take it out and measure the trim potentiometer using the ohmmeter. And we can see 63 almost 64 ohms of added resistance. So this coupled with the 50 ohms ESR of the quartz crystal gives us a total of 114 ohms of negative resistance. So far more than we had with our previous circuit. Now with this crystal, we have a larger ESR of 50 ohms. So the total oscillation margin isn't that much bigger, but it's still bigger than we had before. Now, if you change the crystal, you'll also have to remeasure everything else. So check the drive level, check the oscillation frequency and so on. But if you take a crystal with lower load capacity requirements, in most cases, you will be able to increase your negative resistance. In the end, negative resistance is part of a set of measurements. And measures that you might take to improve one aspect of the crystal oscillator might have a detrimental effect on another parameter. So as always, if any changes are necessary based on this measurement, then every other measurement needs to be redone. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date on my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.